So, as you uh, probably all know, that uh, transport layer security is uh, the most important uh, cryptographic protocol. So, uh, uh, in the recent years, well, we saw in the very recent years many uh, attacks on this protocol, like uh, crime, beast, lucky thirteen, hard bleed, early CCS, and so on. And uh, so, what? Uh, uh, what is uh, maybe forgotten is the attack uh, Bleichenbacher's attack. So this attack was issued uh, 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 20 years ago, and it was applied to uh, RSA PKCS 1.5 encryption scheme in SSL-TLS. So it allowed an attacker to decrypt SSL-TLS traffic. And uh, many implementations, because it was uh, very serious, many implementations and also uh, the uh, TLS specifications applied fixes. And uh, everybody would uh, probably think that uh, now we are secure. But of course, this is not the case, because I would otherwise not be here. So I am presenting you a return of Breichenbacher's record threat. And this is a very serious attack, because as you know, probably it has a logo and his uh, attack name and so on. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, um, Bleichenbacher's attack, how it works, uh, then how we started our research and how we performed our attacks on uh, Facebook, uh, how we performed our TLS scans and how we found uh, new vulnerabilities in different products. And then I'm uh, going to talk about, about uh, responsible disclosure, how we could identify several vendors and so on and so on. So let's start with the Bleichenbacher's attack. So on a very, very high level, TLS protocol is divided uh, into uh, two phases. In the first phase, the TLS handshake, uh, the two parties, client and server, have to negotiate uh, algorithms, uh, TLS version, extensions, and so on and so on. And they perform a, a, a key exchange. There are three types of key exchanges. So RSA key exchange, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and Diffie-Hellman ephemeral key exchange. And afterwards, after they exchange the keys, they can uh, proceed with the encrypted uh, and authenticated data transport. <coughs> so for, for this talk, it is important the RSA TLS uh, key exchange. So uh, how does it work in, uh, on a very high level? <coughs> so imagine uh, we have a client who wants to communicate with a TLS server. So first, what he does is uh, he sends a client hello message. In this client hello message, he says something like, uh, hey, I want to communicate with you with this TLS version, cipher suites, extensions, and so on. The server responds with a server hello message with uh, the certificate. Certificate contains the public key of the server and a server hello down message. Afterwards, the client sends, uh, so the client has now the public key of the server. So it can encrypt something like uh, RSA Pre-master secret. This pre-master secret is uh, used to derive all the secrets in the TLS protocol. So this uh, pre-master secret is encrypted with the public key uh, of the server and sent to the server. Afterwards, the client can send uh, chain cipher spec and finish messages, which authenticate the client. The server accepts uh, the client key exchange message, uh, decrypts the pre-master secret, and then can authenticate itself so with, uh, uh, with the finish message. OK, for the next uh, part of my talk, the client key exchange message is of crucial importance. So this client key exchange message contains an RSA encrypted pre-master secret. And uh, RSA, uh, this pre-master secret is encrypted using uh, RSA PKCS1 version 1.5. So in general, this padding scheme is used to pet and encrypt the, uh, the secrets. So in order to pet it to uh, the specific uh, RSA key length and uh, to add some randomization to the message. So uh, to give you an example of how it is used in TLS 1.2, uh, so uh, the first two bytes of uh, the uh, encrypted pre-master secret uh, contain 0002. This, is, uh, this uh, signalizes or this uh, sh shows that it is encryption block type. Then there is uh, a non-zero padding uh, byte uh, scheme, uh, which is terminated with a zero, zero delimiter. And then there is TLS 1.2 version, which is uh, indicated with uh, version byte 0303. 0, 0, 3. And at the end, we have uh, the pre-master secret. So this is a fixed structure of ERSA PKC 1.5 padding scheme, and uh, which uh, was exploited in uh, the Blackenbacher attack. So in 1998, so 20 years ago, uh, Daniel Blackenbacher showed uh, an adaptive chosen ciphertext attack. And uh, 
this ciphertext attack, uh, chosen ciphertext attack, exploits a strict validation in RSA PKC 1.5 messages. Uh, I will not go into the cryptographic details, but uh, show you a very, very high level overview of the attack. So imagine we have a client who wants to communicate with a server and sends a ciphertext to the server. And we have an attacker who observes uh, the communication, eavesdrops the ciphertext, and uh, somehow modifies it cryptographically <coughs> and sends the modified ciphertext to the server. And the client misuses or the, the, the attacker misuses the server as an oracle. So because the server, what he does, it uh, decrypts the message and validates whether it starts uh, with 02, 0002 or not. And depending on the validity of uh, this message, of the decrypted message, the server responds somehow with valid or invalid. And uh, afterwards, uh, the, uh, the attacker learns something, some partial information about the message, and he proceeds with further messages. With uh, the next ciphertext, he learns uh, further bits uh, uh, with, uh, with the response of the, of the server, and so on and so on, until he can decrypt the whole message. So as I already mentioned, I'm not going into the details. There is some math needed uh, behind the paper, behind, behind the attack. So if you want to talk, uh, talk about the attack, just approach me during the coffee break. So, and what maybe you need to know or what is interesting is that uh, uh, the, the attack is also called the million message attack. And uh, but uh, because uh, the attacker needs to uh, perform or to issue about hundred uh, about million messages to the server, but uh, in uh, the real world, uh, the performance of, of this attack varies a lot. So uh, in some cases, you can issue just a few thousands of messages. In some cases, you need to issue millions of queries. It depends strongly depends on the uh, strictness of the oracle. I'm not going into detail here. So how can we create uh, Blackenbacher's Oracle uh, in TLS implementation? So how does it apply? So imagine we have the attacker who wants to uh, decrypt uh, the message, and how can we apply the modified uh, ciphertext uh, in the TLS handshake? So he again sends uh, the client hello message, uh, receives the certificate and server hello messages, and afterwards in the client key change message, which contains the ciphertext, uh, uh, he inserts the modified ciphertext, which uh, contains the uh, padded the RSA PKC is 1.5 padded pre-master secret. <clears throat> Afterwards, uh, the server attempts uh, to decrypt the message, and uh, depending on the ciphertext validity, uh, depending on uh, whether the, the message starts with 0002 or not, uh, then it sends maybe decrypt error or bad record MAC alert or something different. And this way, the attacker is able to distinguish valid or invalid messages. <clears throat> so uh, this. Uh, handshake can then be performed several times, and uh, uh, the attacker can decrypt the original connection. Okay, so what is the countermeasure that was applied in uh, the TLS specification? The countermeasure is, uh, in theory, very simple. So what the attacker needs to do is, uh, so what the server needs to do is to always respond with the same alert message, so the, that the attacker cannot distinguish uh, valid from invalid messages. And if this is uh, Implement it correctly if the attacker can distinguish valid from invalid messages uh, using alerts or using other side channels, then uh, the attacker uh, has no oracle and he cannot perform Blackenbacher's attack. So <clears throat> in the next minutes, so you just need to consider that uh, we have this Blackenbacher's attack. And uh, if the attacker can distinguish valid from invalid ciphertexts, valid from invalid messages, then he can apply Blackenbacher's attack. Okay, so how did the research start, or how uh, how, do, uh, how did we start? Mm, so uh, about one year ago, Hanno approached me uh, and said that uh, he performed some initial scans of uh, several hosts, and he found a weird behavior of uh, the Facebook server. And he uh, pointed me out to that uh, the server, instead of uh, responding with uh, general alert messages, it responds with, uh, depending on the client key exchange message, uh, he, uh, the server responds with illegal parameter alert or bad record make alert. <coughs> well, we are analyzing it and we found out, okay, it's uh, really a problem. Uh, and we ask ourselves, so is it exploitable? 
So in order to, um, so and we wanted to prove it somehow. So typically in Blackenbacher's attack, you decrypt some messages and uh, you decrypt some uh, handshake that was uh, used. But uh, we had an idea, so it would be funny to sign a message with Facebook's private key. Because uh, what uh, many people do not know is that uh, gen in general, Blackenbacher's attack can be used also for signing messages. So it is able, the, the attack allows you to decrypt messages or to sign messages, so to perform any private key operation if the server is vulnerable to it. So there are millions of queries needed. Uh, we asked ourselves, would Facebook block us or is it even feasible to do this? And after several attempts, uh, we were uh, really surprised that it works and we were able to sign a message we had Facebook with Black and Bacher Oracle and with our initials. And if you want to uh, prove it, then uh, we have a script on our web page, which uh, consists of the signature and uh, it downloads the certificate from certificate transparency and validates that this message is really signed with Facebook's private key. Okay, so we reported it, of course, to Facebook. Uh, we got some bug bounties, which was nice. And uh, then uh, Hanno talked about it with some guys, so with Craig, and Craig uh, had an idea, okay, what can we do about it, so uh, we can verify it, uh, whether Facebook is uh, still vulnerable. And his idea was maybe to play with the TLS handshake, and what he did, he removed the chain self respect and client finish message. And uh, in case these messages were sent, then uh, the Facebook server always responded uh, with uh, um, general alert messages. But uh, once these uh, uh, client messages were not there, then uh, the server just uh, responded with uh, a TCP reset in case the client key message was invalid, or the, mes uh, the server responded with a timeout. So uh, the server waited for different messages, for further messages. So this was a night side channel. So uh, using this uh, uh, strange behavior, we can again apply Blackenbacher's attack. So we uh, reported it to Facebook, received bug bounties, and uh, yeah, so this was uh, uh, very interesting. And we asked ourselves, so, okay, so Facebook is doing this wrong, so how about other servers? <clears throat> and uh, we asked ourselves, so, okay, we can perform some scannings. And we can scan for the vulnerabilities. And uh, so we decided uh, to uh, select careful client key exchange messages, with, uh, which could somehow trigger Blackenbacher's attack and Blackenbacher's attack behavior. So what we did, so we modified the uh, TLS version. So we inserted an uh, invalid TLS version inside. So instead of 0303, we inserted some uh, invalid bytes there. Uh, we uh, inserted wrong padding length. So we uh, moved the padding um, uh, the zero delimiter to the right or to, to, to the left to uh, trick the server. Or we uh, decided to uh, send different messages which are not starting with 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 2. And we, of course, uh, we also played with our new handshake. So we uh, tested with uh, full and shortened handshake messages, which uh, have uh, changed our first flag messages and finished messages, or which omitted this. OK. so. We scanned uh, only Alexa top 1 million uh, servers uh, because of performance reasons, and uh, we wanted to uh, get the most important servers. Uh, and we found out that 2.8% uh, of servers were vulnerable to this attack. So this seems to be not that much, but uh, most of the servers, most of the high-profile servers like PayPal, Apple, eBay, Cisco, and so on were vulnerable to these attacks, which was quite surprising. And from the scientific perspective, it was also very surprising that uh, we saw different behaviors in different combinations. So it was not only one server, only one vendor responsible for this, but there were different vendors. And so we, what we saw was uh, dif uh, were different uh, combinations of TCP connection resets or timeouts, depending on the uh, TLS protocol flow or TLS messages sent. We send different alert messages uh, in different combinations, like illegal parameter, bad record MAC, handshake failure, internal alert, and so on and so on. And what was also interesting uh, from my perspective was that uh, we saw duplicate alert messages. So in some cases, uh, the 
the implementations attempted to verify or to implement the countermeasure. So they sent only a general alert message, like bad record make, always the same. But in uh, case the message was valid or the client key exchange was PKC1 valid, then uh, it sent only one alert message. And uh, in case it was invalid, then sent uh, two alert messages. OK, this was kind of nice. So we had, uh, uh, we had many servers which were affected. And uh, we uh, were trying to do some uh, responsible disclosure. And uh, to the, uh, to find out uh, which vendors are affected, uh, who is responsible for these mistakes. And you know from uh, different conferences that there are papers which are handling uh, this uh, responsible disclosure process. In case of, uh, for example, cross-site scripting, this is uh, maybe easier because uh, the developers are familiar with uh, cross-site scripting and uh, with this sort of bugs in HackerOne and so on and so on. But uh, in case of cryptographic bugs or TLS implementation, this is not always that easy. So uh, as we, we constructed different messages to the servers with the description of the vulnerabilities, so, uh, we attempted to do, approach them, but we also, so we said something like, your server is vulnerable to black embarrassed attack, this is the vulnerability, blah, blah, blah. And uh, what we sometimes got was like, no worries, we use military grade encryption and uh, uh, we are safe. Uh, okay, uh, so this was, uh, but we, there were also cases where we found out who was responsible for this. So, uh, so for example, but it was also not a solution for us. For example, in the case of Cisco ACA devices, uh, we, uh, which support only TRS RSA. So as a developer or as a server administrator, you could also switch to Diffie Hellman and to disable all TLS RSA cipher suites. In case of Cisco, this is not possible so because they only support TLS RSA. And uh, this Cisco device was not, uh, was vulnerable, and they responded to us, okay, we won't fix it because it's out of uh, support for several years. But we were uh, very considerate about this because there were many websites vulnerable to this uh, to this attack. And for example, it was like Cisco.com. <laughs> um, okay, I do not know what is the current status of this. Maybe they moved their website to a different product, like. Uh, but in the end, uh, we were able with, uh, ma uh, so mainly with the help of uh, Hanno and Craig, who have good connections to the developers and uh, uh, to different people behind the servers, uh, uh, they, we were able to uh, somehow uh, tr uh, find out who is behind the different implementations. And uh, we found many, many different uh, applications which were vulnerable in different ways. So it was interesting. For example, this is the list of our attacks, uh, which is also on our website with uh, the CVEs. And what was, for example, interesting is that uh, F5 products, there were five servers uh, having five different vulnerabilities, five different responses. So I don't know how do they implement their stacks or what do they do with them, but five different uh, uh, sorts of vulnerabilities in their TLS stacks. OK. Uh, so we notified them. They uh, fixed this. And uh, so what we do, uh, did also, in addition to our work, to the responsible disclosures, we were not able to track every vendor. So what we also did as a part of our responsible disclosure, we uh, informed also uh, developers of different test tools like uh, SSLabs, TestLs, SH, or TLS Fuzzer. And uh, the problem was maybe that uh, these uh, simple TLS scan applications did not have uh, scans for black and white attacks. And we provided them with our uh, scan scripts and, for example, now since uh, I'm in December, SLF uh, contains Black and Bacher Oracle vulnerability scan of, um, on their website. Okay. So uh, this brings me to a conclusion about the future work and in general. So in conclusion, or uh, what I propose uh, in the future work. So a few years ago, we presented timing attacks on. A, Open, uh, open source implementations. Uh, there would be uh, blacking buffer side channels here. At the Usenix, maybe it would be nice to take a look at uh, closed source implementations from F5 or other devices. It would be you would definitely find something. Uh, as we could see that uh, using these vulnerabilities, you can do some fingerprinting. And uh, what we also saw in some cases uh, is that uh, some 
after sending wrong client key exchange messages, the servers are responding with some garbage bytes. So maybe you can perform something like uh, blading buffers or hard blade state uh, uh, memory disclosure. Okay. So in conclusion, uh, we were able to uh, apply the 20-year-old attack, Blackenbacher's attack, and we showed that it works with different new side channels like timeout, TCP resets, and so on and so on. And uh, we proved that uh, crypto attack countermeasures are hard to apply even if they are in the TILA specification and uh, even if uh, they are explicitly mentioned there. In, uh, uh. Okay, so our my recommendations are that uh, you disable TLS RSA cipher suites, which are not there in TLS 1.3 because of these reasons. And uh, you should, in general, disable RSA PKS 1.5 and switch to elliptic curves or to RSA OP if RSA is needed. Okay, thank you very much. A few minutes for questions. So uh, I can start with a quick question. So as you mentioned that you, when you contact the affected vendors, they have different responses. Uh, do you have any thoughts of what fundamentally that make them not motivated or sometimes difficult to fix the problem? You mean uh, uh, why wasn't it fixed uh, a few years ago before? Or I mean uh, the, uh, the major problem was uh, that uh, uh, the tools that uh, are provided to TLS developers like TestLSH or SLAPS, which is now commonly used tool, uh, does not uh, contain a Blackenbacher attack scan. So this was uh, well known for, for example, open source developers like OpenSSL and uh, uh, other um, developers do not include these fixes, but maybe in a large scale, it is necessary that we provide to the developers like uh, useful tools which allow them to uh, test uh, with uh, positive and negative tests so that they can test their implementation and uh, where they are vulnerable. <laughs> Uh, just a question about the, the remediation rates. Um, did you, can you, do you do continuous scans still to figure out if notifying the vendors was enough? Because as you pointed out, it may be helpful to tell the administrators if they understand what you're saying. Yeah, so uh, this is, uh, we, we are not doing that. So we, uh, our recent scans that we performed were uh, probably November or December last year. And afterwards we said, okay, we are done. We uh, release our attack paper and uh, everybody who is vulnerable also can uh, use uh, the newly developed tools or SSL apps. So uh, now it is much, much easier to find out where they are vulnerable. So what was interesting uh, is uh, that after our disclosure, there were new implementations popping out. So even like two, two weeks ago, we found out that uh, there was a new implementation which was found to be vulnerable to some attacks. And it was only because probably one of the test tools found it. Okay. But maybe it would be interesting too if, if there's now kind of updated versions of the, the software running on like these, these HTTP endpoints or the mm -hmm. HTTP end, S endpoints to now tell people uh, like your vendor that you bought the hardware from said that this is a problem so you need to update. So maybe there's still room for improving things with notifications. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe there would be, so, so uh, what would be nice is to do something like fingerprinting, so uh, in general fingerprinting of uh, different TLS server implementations, so uh, instead of contacting the website administrator, you can directly go to the vendor and to uh, uh, tell them, okay, you are vulnerable and you should fix it. Maybe this, this, this would speed up the process uh, very much in comparison to go over the website administrator, which was quite yep, thank boring. You. So uh, we might have time for a very quick question. Uh, so my question is about what you were able to get signed using uh, Facebook's private key. Mm -hmm. uh, question is like what are the implications of that? Because it doesn't seem like you could sign like another server certificate, but then maybe I'm missing something. Uh, okay, it was uh, just a uh, normal leaf certificate. So uh, just uh, okay. So the black and white attackers is only able to perform RSA private key operations. So you are not able to extract the private key. You are able to sign some messages, but of course this was a leaf certificate, so you, you are not able to uh, to sign further certificates or something with it. So it was not exploitable. It was, yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Let's take the speakers again. Thank you.